Shalom. I'm glad you've joined us today for Life and Messiah's Interactive Seder. My name is Levi Hazen. I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of Life and Messiah and is your host for today's Passover experience. At Life and Messiah, we've been laser focused on sharing God's heart for the Jewish people since 1887. We are committed to sharing the good news of Messiah Yeshua with Jewish people all over the globe. We stand against anti-Semitism in all its forms and edify the church with sound Bible teaching. We hope this Seder today will enrich your love for the scriptures and help you see the desperate need the Jewish people have for the gospel. Now, before we begin the Seder, I want to make sure that you have a Haggadah. If you don't have your own copy of this helpful booklet, I encourage you to pause the video, open a new browser, and head over to lifeandmessiah.org forward slash Seder. On our site, you can download your very own copy for free. Once you've got that in front of you, you're ready to resume the video. Today, I will lead us through the Passover Seder experience, teaching as we go, and I encourage you to participate with me as we explore the different elements on the Seder table and learn from this ancient celebratory meal. Before we begin, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful picture of redemption that, that we see from the Passover all the way through the sacrifice of your son, the Passover lamb, Jesus Messiah. And so we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to participate in this meal and to learn from this experience. And so we pray that you would open our eyes to new things today and help us be encouraged from what we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you have your little booklet in front of you, I'm going to invite you to flip over to the back side, the side that's all blue. There are two words here that we want to be familiar with today. The first, as you can see, is the Hebrew word seder. The Hebrew word seder simply means order. Why is this a seder meal? Because it's an ordered meal. And we'll see that as we go along. Throughout centuries of dispersion, Jewish people have celebrated Israel's oldest celebration or holiday with a Passover Seder meal. The other word you see on the back page there is the Hebrew word Haggadah. And that simply means retelling. Because every single year, Jewish communities around the world retell the Passover story in an effort to remember what God did when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt, in an effort to memorialize his faithfulness to the Jewish people and to the nations. So, you have your Haggadah in front of you, and if you would turn to what you likely would turn to as the front page, it's page 52 in your booklet there, we'll cover just a few more things before we dive in. First of all, you may have already noticed in leafing through the book that it appears to be printed backwards. However, as some of you already know, Hebrew is read from right to left. Therefore, it's not really backwards to the readers of the original language. Now, you'll also see that we have different words in the Haggadah that really don't make any sense. So what you see there is we've tried to provide a transliteration of the Hebrew word. Uh, and it helps those wishing to gain an ear for the language of the Bible. You'll also see throughout the Haggadah that we have different symbols. There's an hourglass symbol where we've tried to mark that this is a period where God is at work in history and on the biblical calendar. You'll also see the picture of a lamb. This is a direct connection to the Passover lamb himself, Messiah Yeshua. We also have the picture of a menorah, and that indicates that that particular part of the service is traditionally part of the Jewish tradition. And then you, of course, see the Star of David with the fish symbol in the middle. That indicates that this is a direct messianic connection 
between the Passover Seder experience as well as to Jesus. You'll also notice that we've chosen to include a dash in the words God and Lord. We do this to preserve the sanctity of the name of the Holy One. Why would we do that in the Passover meal? Because our observant Jewish friends neither write nor pronounce the name of God. And so therefore, in an effort to respect that tradition, we have also added a dash in the words God and Lord. So, I would encourage you throughout the meal to really safeguard this book and watch out for any grape juice spilling. Now, to begin with, let's flip over to the actual first page of the Haggadah. Much of today's ordered service will follow the Haggadah. And generally, you'll be able to read along with me as we go through this wonderful celebratory meal together. Starting at the top of page three, we read, Passover is a joyful time of celebrating the faithfulness of the God of Israel in redeeming his people from bondage. When the Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt, God actually instructed them, this Passover day is to be a memorial for you, and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statute. We find that in Exodus chapter 12. We also see that Passover was designed as a family event. The scriptures tell us that for the Jewish people, they are to celebrate it as a family so that it could be passed on from generation to generation. Now, Jewish and Gentile believers in Messiah Jesus have been united by faith. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2. But from the very beginning, the Lord made conditional provision for non-Jewish or foreigners to participate in the Passover meal. And it's also amazing that in Messiah, our Jewish friends and Gentile friends are one and the same. In understanding that Yeshua has fully met the demands of the Torah or the law, today it is our joyful privilege to celebrate the Passover together, remembering the historical significance of God's redemption of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Also, I hope today that you'll be able to see a completed picture of the blood of the Lamb of God applied for our redemption to bondage and sin. And also, I hope today that you'll be able to see the wonderful connection between the Passover meal and communion. Now, at the very first Passover, God gave specific instructions to the Israelites. He told them that they were to select an unblemished year-old lamb on the 10th of the month of Aviv. The lamb was to be watched until it was finally slaughtered on the 14th of the month, and it had to be watched to ensure that it was without defect. In addition to the choosing of the lamb, all leaven, or what we would usually call yeast, must be completely removed from the household. And the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs were to be included in the Passover meal preparations. Let's turn to the next page. At the top of your page, you have the search for leaven. On the night preceding Passover, there's a tradition that uh, even continues on to this day. And basically what will happen is a Jewish family will clean out all of their house of all the leaven during that week. The night before, typically the father, along with the kids, will search the house for any remaining leaven. Now, the mother by this time has strategically placed little bits of leaven in order for the father and the kids to find, to sweep up, and to get it out of the house. What's interesting is that Passover seems to always take place in the springtime. And many have connected 
this sweeping out of the house, this cleaning out, to an American tradition of spring cleaning. So is it possible that a lot of Gentiles were looking in their community at their Jewish friends saying, yeah, it is getting warm out. It is a wonderful time to clean out the house. And so began the tradition of spring cleaning. It's possible. Now, usually every Jewish holiday, at least the ones that are celebratory in nature, begins with the lighting of the candles. And that is certainly the case with Passover. Typically, it's the mother of the household that comes and lights the candles and says a blessing. So I don't have my mom here today, but I'm happy that my wife is here and she is the mother of our household. And so I've invited my wife to come on up to light the candles for us and to say the Hebrew blessing. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו, ונתן לנו את נך העולם ישוע. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart by his commandments, and has given us the light of the world, ישוע. ברוך אתה אדוני, אלוהינו מלך העולם, שהחיינו וקימנו והגיינו לזמן הזה. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sustained us, preserved us, and enabled us to reach this season. Amen. Thank you. Now, that the candles have been lit, our Passover meal can officially begin. If you would, turn the page with me, and we are ready to fill our first cup. As I mentioned to you before, this is called a Seder meal, and that means it's an ordered meal. There's a specific order by which we go through things. And the meal is really based around four cups. And so you should have four cups in front of you. And this first cup corresponds to an action that God promised in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It's referred to as the cup of sanctification or blessing. In Exodus 6, 6, God says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So, now's the time to go ahead and fill that first cup. I will say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English, and we'll drink together of the first cup. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Amen. And we've now completed the first of our four cups. That brings us to page seven. We'll start at the top. At the first Passover, we read in the scriptures, the instructions were to be dressed and ready for travel and to eat in haste, or to eat in a hurry. Today, because Jewish people don't have to eat in a hurry and escape Egyptian slavery, overstuffed pillows or chairs are actually used to demonstrate the contrast between present leisure and comfort and the state of hurry back then. Today, the instruction to drink in a reclining position reflects this current tradition. Now, during the Last Supper, Yeshua celebrated a Passover meal with his disciples. And we see from John 13, 23, that the one Jesus loved reclined against him. Jesus and his disciples were likely seated at a very low table on the floor, perhaps with things like cushions and other soft items so that they could recline comfortably. Therefore, John would have been seated next to Jesus, and it would have been very natural for him to recline against him. 
It's a very different picture from what we see in the common portraits of the Last Supper, where everyone is seated at a very high table, and they're all in different chairs and so forth. And in that depiction, it would have been quite awkward for John to lean against Jesus. However, it's much easier to picture if we know the historical context, and that is that they were likely all seated on the floor at a very low table, reclining on cushions. Now, we see in the middle of page 7 the traditional washing. Washing is for cleanliness, and it reminds us of our impurity before a holy God. We see that even Aaron and his sons washed in the basin before approaching the altar in the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 30. Now, in Jesus' day, in that upper room where the Passover meal was prepared, we see Jesus actually washing the feet of his disciples. He says, So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. And if Jesus, God in the flesh, is willing and able to humble himself to the point of washing the dirty, smelly feet of his disciples, surely that is a wonderful example for us, and we should do the same with our fellow brothers and sisters. If you would turn with me to page 8. We are ready to start exploring more of the elements here in front of us. The first element that we come to is karpas. This is the word for parsley. So hopefully you have some parsley right there in front of you and we can partake together. Any fruit of the earth that's not bitter may be eaten, but traditionally we do use parsley. The green parsley reminds us of the hyssop that was used to apply the blood to the doorposts and lentils as God commanded in Exodus chapter 12. And what's going to happen here is that we are going to take a little bit of the parsley, and you should also have some salt water, which is what I have right here. We're going to dip the parsley into the salt water, and then we're going to eat it. Now, what does the salt water remind us of? Well, typically, it's the tears that were shed by the Hebrew slaves. Uh, obviously, Israel had a very difficult time enduring 400 years of bondage and slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. So, let's dip it together. I'll say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English, and we'll eat together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Bore pri ha Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. Now, after the parsley, we have what's called the yachatz, or the divide. Perhaps you have on your table as well some matzah. My matzah is in what's called a matzah tash, or a matzah bag. And within the bag, I have three different compartments, each holding a piece of matzah. So what I'd like you to do is to go ahead and remove the middle piece of matzah from this bag. Once you've removed the matzah from the bag, you can hold it in front of you, perhaps over a plate, because you're going to get some crumbs. You're going to break it in half, and then you're going to take one of the pieces, and you're going to wrap them inside of another bag. Now, this bag is for our afikomen, and we're going to want to pay special attention, especially the children will want to pay special attention to this bag. If you don't have a bag, you can feel free to just use a napkin or a paper towel or something else. I'm going to put it in the bag, and I'm going to set it to my side. That brings us to page 9 of our Haggadah. 
course, we have the matzah in front of us here, and I am going to recite this prayer, and I'd encourage you to say the prayer with me, beginning with, this is the bread of affliction. We'll all say it together. This is the bread of affliction, which our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are in need come and celebrate Passover. Today, we are here. Next year, in the land of Israel. Today, we are slaves. Next year, we'll be free. Now, at this point, even though we're not ready to drink of it quite yet, we're going to go ahead and fill our second cup with grape juice. And instead of continuing on uh, as the Haggadah advises us to do here, we are actually going to break away from the Haggadah moment, and we are going to go directly to Exodus chapter 12, where I am going to read the Passover story uh, just so we can be in the right frame of mind today. So if you have your Bible in front of you, go ahead and turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Otherwise, we'll have the words on the screen. Exodus chapter 12 says this, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So we see right away in verses 1 and 2 that God used the Passover event to begin the calendar year. Verse 3, Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. Now, to be without blemish means it is without defect. It had to be essentially a perfect lamb that was selected. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Now, just by way of review here, we see that on the 10th of the month, the Israelites were to select a lamb without defect, a lamb without blemish. That lamb then had to be watched carefully for the next few days, all the way until the 14th, to be sure that it was continued to be without defect. And then, on the 14th day, at twilight, the Israelites were to slaughter those lambs. Verse 7 says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. So already we have a few different uh, elements that have been mentioned just in these verses. Of course, we have the lamb that's mentioned. And in today's traditional Passover meals, actually, lamb is not a traditional meat that is eaten at Passover. Instead, we have the lamb shank here. Um, and so, also mentioned, though, already, has been the hyssop. And the hyssop was used to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and the lintel of the homes. They shall eat it, the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread. What's the word we use for unleavened bread? It's matzah. That's how we get matzah in the Passover meal. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its heads with its legs and its inner parts. That brings us to verse 10. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, 
both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you in the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is how we get the term Passover. It's because God specifically instructed the Israelites to slaughter the lamb, to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and lentils of their homes. And then when God went through to strike the firstborn of Egypt, he would pass over those homes where he saw the blood of the lamb. Verse 14 says, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, or matzah. On the first day you shall remove the leaven out of your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So we see there a serious crime is keeping leaven in your home during this period. When we get to some New Testament connections, that explains why the New Testament uses leaven and sin together. Verse 16 says, On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work should be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, which today is really combined with Passover. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. Verse 18. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. And so just that portion of Exodus chapter 12 really gets us in the right frame of mind to celebrate the Passover meal. So now we are ready in our Haggadah for page 10. And this is the Ma Nishtana portion of the Seder meal. Essentially, four questions. And typically, it's the youngest child able to read that recites these four questions. And therefore, that fulfills the biblical injunction to tell our children about the flight from slavery to freedom. So I don't have my two-year-old son with me here today. However, I'll read through these questions, and you can follow along in the Haggadah. First, why is this night different from all other nights? Question one. On all other nights, we eat either leavened bread or matzah. Why on this night do we eat only matzah? Question two. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. Why on this night must we eat bitter herbs? Question three. On all other nights, we do not dip our herbs even once. Why on this night do we dip them twice, once into salt water and once into sweet fruit? Question four. On all other nights, everyone sits up or reclines while eating. Why on this night do we all recline? And typically there's a song that goes along with these four questions as well. Uh, We will skip that in the interest of time this evening, but it's a wonderful song and I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. Now, Because of our time limitations, we're going to skip ahead uh, quite a ways in the Passover Haggadah. However, I'd encourage you, after our time together today, to go back and read through some of these things that we're skipping over, as it's educational and greatly edifying. Let's skip all the way over to page 20 of our Haggadah. We are ready for the ten plagues. Now, the purpose in the plagues, as we see in Exodus chapter 7 through 11, is clearly seen in Exodus 12, 12, where God says, I will execute judgments 
against all the gods of Egypt. You see, the Egyptians were polytheists, and God's explicit intent was to demonstrate his supremacy over the idols of Egypt. His audiences were Pharaoh, who of course stated, I don't know the Lord, as well as the Egyptians and the Hebrews. Ultimately, the world would come to know about what God did to the Egyptians in order to rescue the Israelites out of bondage. So, we have 10 plagues, and you can see in your Haggadah there, those 10 plagues are listed one right after the other in the purple box. Now, you have your second cup poured already. So, go ahead and place that right next to you. And I would encourage you at this point maybe to grab a napkin or a paper towel, something like that, because we're going to dip our pinkies in the grape juice. Why would we do that? Well, essentially, the Bible tells us that we should never really rejoice in anyone's misfortunes. And so the Jewish community has built that principle into the Passover meal. So although we're so glad that God fulfilled his promises and rescued the Israelites out of Egypt, we don't really want to gloat or have a lot of joy at the pain that they experienced at the hands of God Almighty. Therefore, because the second cup is the cup of joy or the cup of rejoicing, we are going to lessen our joy just a little bit out of respect for, again, all the pain that the Egyptians went through. So here's what will happen. I will read through the ten plagues. I will say the plague. And as we do that, we're going to dip our pinkies together and then just get one drop out of the cup, thereby lessening our joy. So let's do this together. I'll say the specific plague and you repeat after me. Blood. Frogs. Lice. Flies. Cattle disease. Boils. Hail. Locusts. Darkness. And the death of the firstborn. So, now we have officially lessened our rejoicing because of the pain that the Egyptians endured. That brings us over to page 21 of your Haggadah. This is where we get to Dainu. Dainu is a wonderful Hebrew word, and it simply means it would have been enough. In other words, if all God had did was rescue us, it would have been enough. But Dainu carries the sense, but he did so much more. And so we want to celebrate all that God did when he rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, if I had a good voice, I would sing the traditional Dainu song for you. But God has not gifted me with any kind of a singing voice. Therefore, we've put together something special for you. And I hope that you'll sing along with us in this traditional song, Dainu. So before we get into the actual singing, we're going to go over the Hebrew words so that you're familiar with them and so you guys will be able to sing along with us. So the first one is, of course, Dayenu. Everybody say, Dayenu. Great. It means it would have been enough. So the, if you look at the verse here, the first verse, it says, I'll, I'll say the words and you repeat after me. Ilu, Hotzi, Hotzianu, Hotzianu mi Mitzrayim. Hotzianu mi Mitzrayim, Dayenu. Great. And the chorus is easy. It's Dai Dayenu. And then we have the second verse, all right? Repeat after me. Ilu, Natan, Natan Lanu, Natan Lanu, et Hatora. Natan Lanu, et Hatora. Dai Yenu. All right, you got it? So 
we're gonna I'm gonna sing the chorus for you one time so you get an idea of how the flow goes. And then after that, we'll start and we'll sing the whole song together. So here's the chorus. Dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai yenu, dai yenu, dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai dai yenu, dai yenu, dai yenu. Wonderful. All right. So now we're going to start on the first verse. We'll do the first verse twice, the chorus, and we'll do the second verse twice, and then back to the chorus. Okay. So you guys follow along. Sing at home. It's a great time, a great experience to have at Passover. Ilu hotzi hotzi anu hotzi anu mi mitzrayim hotzi anu mi mitzrayim dayenu. Ilu hotzi hotzi anu hotzi anu mi mitzrayim hotzi anu mi mitzrayim dayenu. Dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai dai enu, dai enu, dai enu. Ilu natan natan lanu natan lanu eta tora natan lanu eta tora dai enu. Ilu natan natan lanu natan lanu eta tora natan lanu eta tora dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai enu dai enu dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai enu dai enu one more time dai dai enu dai dai enu Dai dai enu dai enu dai enu dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai dai enu dai enu dai enu. Great job, guys! I hope you enjoyed that wonderful dai enu experience. Let's read back through the song together in English. Beginning at the top, it says, "How abundant are the many favors of the Omnipotent upon us." Had he brought us out of Egypt and not executed judgments against the Egyptians, it would have been enough. And then we say Dainu, because it would have been enough, but he did so much more. I'm going to read every other paragraph here. It says, had he executed judgments against their gods and not put to death their firstborn, it would have been enough. Dainu. Let's go to page 22, top of the page. Had he given us all their wealth and not split the sea for us? Dainu. Had he led us through on dry land and not drowned our oppressors in it? Dainu. Had he supplied our needs in the desert for 40 years and not fed us with manna? Dainu. Top of page 23. Had he given us the Sabbath and not brought us to Mount Sinai? Dainu. Had he given us the Torah and not brought us into Israel? Dainu. And had he brought us into Israel and not built the temple for us? Dainu. And as believers in the Messiah of Israel, as God's provision for our redemption, we add another line to this favorite Passover song altogether. If all he had given us was Yeshua, we would have had more than enough. Dainu. That brings us over to page 24 of your Haggadah. Page 24, we see that uh, Rabbi Gamliel, the rabbi who instructed the Apostle Paul, taught that there were three principal symbols of the original Passover meal, and they should be emphasized. And he would say that all of those who had not spoken three things about Passover had not fulfilled their obligation to tell the whole story. And of course, those three things are the Passover lamb, the matzah, and the maror, or the bitter herbs. Now, since the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, lamb is typically not eaten at the Passover meal. The shank bone on the Seder plate reminds us of that central symbol of Passover, the lamb. The Passover lamb which our ancestors ate when the second temple stood. What is the reason for it? Because the Holy One, blessed is He, passed over the houses of our ancestors in Egypt. As it is said, 
You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. We see that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 27. That brings us to the top of page 25. We see a lot of Passover connections in the New Testament. The authors in the New Testament were very familiar with Passover. Why? Because they were Jewish, and they celebrated Passover on a yearly basis. In John 129, it says this, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that's fascinating. But because the New Testament is written and happening in a Jewish context, John's listeners, his hearers, those standing there that day, would have understood the import of what John was saying about a Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. This is a direct connection to Passover. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, we read, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from the fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. Again, what we see there is that Peter is using Passover imagery to teach through his word. Of course, it was no coincidence that the following things happened to Yeshua. He presented himself in Jerusalem four days before Passover. Now, if you remember, going back to Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb had to be selected four days before it was ultimately slaughtered. We also see that at his trial, Isaiah prophetically describes this individual as a lamb led to the slaughter. And like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. We also see that just as that original Passover lamb back in Exodus was without defect, was without blemish, so Jesus was without defect, without blemish. In fact, he was pronounced guiltless by Pilate in John 19.4. And we also see that like the Passover lamb, and unlike the criminals on either side of Jesus at his crucifixion, not one of Jesus' bones was broken. Now, just as the blood of the Lamb had to be applied to save the lives of each firstborn at the time of the first Passover, so by faith, today, we must individually apply the blood of the Lamb to remove the sentence of death from us. Isaiah 53, 6 tells us, we've all gone astray like sheep. We've all turned to our own way. The Lord has punished him, the Messiah, for the iniquity of us all. John 3.16 tells us that for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Now, perhaps you're tuning into today's Passover meal and you don't quite have a relationship with Jesus, the Passover lamb. I'd invite you to take that step today. And it's simply by faith. You see, just as those first Israelites had to actually apply the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorposts and lentils of their homes, the same is true with us today that we, by faith, apply the blood of Jesus to our hearts today. And how do we do that? Scriptures tells us that it's simply by believing. Believing only in Jesus, that he is God in the flesh, that he was crucified, and on the third day, God raised him to life, proving he was, in fact, God's Messiah. I hope you'll take that step today, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. This offer, this gift of God, is available to all of us.
Now, this brings us over to page 26 of our Haggadah. Matzah. What does it symbolize? We've got our matzah right here. Well, as we know, there was not sufficient time for the dough of our ancestors to rise when the supreme king of kings, the holy one, blessed be he, revealed himself to them. As it is said, they baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into the cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened, since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. We see that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 39. As I mentioned earlier, leaven is used in the New Testament to symbolize sin. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we read, we are instructed to clean out the old yeast so that we may be a new batch. In other words, we need to ensure that we are living holy lives. We need to purify ourselves from all sin and walk in righteousness. It also says, a little yeast leavens the whole lump of dough. We see that in Galatians 5.9. What Paul is teaching us there in Galatians is that just a little bit of sin in our communities has a big impact on everybody. And Passover is such a wonderful time to examine ourselves and to ask the Lord, do I have any leaven in my house? If so, Lord, help me get rid of that leaven so that we can observe the Passover in purity and in thankfulness. This brings us to page 27 of the Haggadah. Why do we eat bitter herbs? Because the Egyptians embittered the lives of our ancestors in Egypt, as it is said in Exodus 1.14, and made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar. And in all kinds of field work, they ruthlessly imposed all of this work on them. As we know, life is full of tears and bitterness. This is a sin-cursed world. Yeshua sympathizes with our plight. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like one people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. We see that again in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 that this Messiah would not be welcomed by everybody. Indeed, he would be rejected. People would turn away from him. It's no surprise that 700 years after Isaiah penned those words, the Messiah came, and by and large, he was rejected by humanity. Of course, there were many who believed in him at the time, but the vast majority of people rejected him, just as Isaiah prophesied they would. This brings us over to page 28. In every generation, each individual is obligated to consider as though he or she had personally gone out of Egypt. As it is said, on that day, explain to your son, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Not only did the Holy One, blessed is he, redeem our ancestors, but also us along with them, as it is said. But he brought us from there in order to lead us in and give us the land that he swore to our fathers. We therefore are privileged to thank, to praise, to adore, glorify, exalt, honor, bless, and reverence him who performed all of these miracles for our ancestors and therefore for us. Indeed, when God took the Israelites out of Egypt, did you know it was a fulfillment of his promises that were made 430 years previous? In Genesis chapter 15, we see God promising Abraham that his descendants would be captives in a land that did not belong to them, and they would be oppressed and enslaved for 400 years. But then at the end of that 400 years, God told Abraham he would bring them out. And so when we read in Exodus of God's bringing the Israelites, freeing the Israelites out of bondage, it is a fulfillment of prophecy. It is a fulfillment of promises that God had made 
to Abraham, and therefore all of us can celebrate as we remember the faithfulness of God. In fact, let's read the bottom portion of page 28 together. You brought us from bondage to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from mourning to a festive day, from darkness to great light, and from slavery to redemption. Now, if you would, we're going to skip a few pages again and head to drink our second cup on page 31. As I mentioned previously, this is the cup of rejoicing. It's connected to the promise found in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, when God promised, I will deliver you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. Again, I'll say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English and we'll drink together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Amen. Now that we're done with our second cup, we know that we're approximately halfway through the Seder meal. I will tell you that the second half goes a lot faster than the first half. If you would, turn the page to page 32. I've already mentioned the tradition of washing before meals. This is a tradition that exists today in the religious Jewish communities. Earlier in his ministry, Jesus had encountered those who were zealous for this particular tradition. And they wanted to know why Jesus' disciples did not ceremonially wash their hands before eating. What was his response? Quote, Nothing that goes into a person from outside can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. We see that in Mark chapter 7, verse 15. Also, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, we read that man sees what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. And what is it that God sees within us? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than anything else and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? No wonder a repentant King David cried out to God, Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. Now, it's time for the prayer over the bread, the motzi. You should have your matzah there in front of you. And if we hold that up, I will go ahead and say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English, and we'll break of it together and eat. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamoitzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. I said, go ahead and break a piece off. We're ready for page 33 of your Haggadah. Now we get to the maror, or the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs, what do they indicate? Well, as we learned earlier, they symbolized the bitterness of bondage. And typically, it's horseradish that's used. And really, the spicier, the better. So with me, go ahead and take a little piece of matzah, and you're going to scoop up some horseradish there. And we're going to partake together remembering the bitterness of bondage. And if you already believe in Messiah Yeshua as your Passover lamb sacrifice, may this also be a reminder to you of the bitterness of bondage of sin. Sin oftentimes just takes hold and entangles us, the scriptures say. And when we believe upon Jesus the Messiah, we don't have to be in bondage to sin any longer. And what a wonderful thing that is. So, together, let's partake of the matzah and the bitter herbs, the maror.
Well, that brings you over to page 34 of your Haggadah. During the time when the temple stood, Hillel, who was a popular rabbi at the time, ate the matzah and the bitter herbs together to fulfill the law. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat the lamb. Of course, without the temple, there's no place to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And so today, in place of the lamb, a choroset uh, is added to the matzah, and horseradish is added in what's called a Hillel sandwich. And so what you're going to do now is you're going to take a couple more pieces of matzah. You're going to skip up some of that sweet apple mixture. That's called choroset. And you're going to mix it with a little bit of the maror or the horseradish. And then you'll have yourself a Hillel sandwich. So once you've made your sandwich, you can go ahead and partake of that. So I mentioned the choroset. What is the choroset? Well, this is a typical mixture of chopped nuts, apples, cinnamon, and usually fruit of the vine. The choroset reminds us of the mortar that was used by the Hebrew slaves when they had to make tons of things for the Egyptians. You'll also see on this Seder plate that we have an egg here. It is traditionally on the Seder plate, and among the interpretations, is that the hard-boiled egg reminds us of the destruction of the temple, which was destroyed by fire in 70 AD. Now, theories are wide and vast on why an egg reminds us of the destruction of the temple, ranging from there are three different parts to the egg, from the shell to the white to the yolk, and just like there are three different parts of the temple. Uh, also, it's said that a hen lays an egg daily, and there was a sacrifice daily at the temple. Um, there are many different theories as to why an egg is included, but we've got one here today. Now, it's at this point that if you've prepared yourself uh, a full meal to eat, it would be a wonderful time to go ahead and pause the video, to eat the meal with your family, uh, discussing what you've learned thus far, and remembering God's faithfulness to his covenant promises. We'll be back with you right after the meal. Since 1887, Life in Messiah has helped Christians understand the Jewish roots of our faith and God's ongoing commitment to his people. We teach that anti-Semitism is inconsistent with biblical faith and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which includes her spiritual renewal as well as physical safety. In all we do, our priority is to share the gospel message. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or at lifeinmessiah.org. That's lifeinmessiah.org. Welcome back from your meal. Before we dive into the second part of the Passover Seder experience, I want to share with you a little bit about the ministry of Life and Messiah International. Since 1887, Life and Messiah has been laser-focused on sharing God's heart for the Jewish people. We do this through a variety of ways, ranging from evangelism, discipleship, and teaching. We have staff all over the globe, including in Argentina, as we reach Israeli backpackers uh, with the good news. We have staff in New York City, uh, in Brooklyn, on the edge of the United States' largest Orthodox neighborhood. We have staff in South Florida, where there is a growing Jewish community. And of course in Israel, where we're reaching out to the down and out of society, providing them with not only food, but a shelter where they can live in and be safe. We have staff in France, reaching Parisians with the good news, including in Seattle and other places around the globe. We also have a growing presence in the digital realm. Life and Messiah is committed to having a digital presence where the truth is being displayed in a Jewish-sensitive way. We do all of these things with the Romans 1.16 priority of to the Jew first. 
If you'd like to learn more about Life and Messiah and even partner with us in prayer, sign up for our newsletters and other publications, or even donate toward our work among the Jewish people, I'd invite you to go to lifeinmessiah.org. That's lifeinmessiah.org, where you can investigate us, learn more about us, and partner with us in this God-given calling. Now, it's time to dive back into our Agata, where we will quickly finish the second half of the Passover Seder experience. You can see at the top of page 35 that we have the word hidden. And we're going to come back around to this little bag where we've hidden what's called the afikomen. If you remember, earlier in our time together, we broke a piece of matzah and we wrapped it in this bag. For some of you, it might be wrapped away and, and hidden aside, maybe in a paper towel or some napkins. Isaiah 53, verse 5 tells us, But he, the Messiah, was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Zechariah 12.10 also says, Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David in the residence of Jerusalem, and they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. In John 19, we see that the Messiah himself was also wrapped and hidden away. Now, this brings us to a very fascinating and rich tradition within the Passover Seder meal, a tradition that honestly, no one really knows how far back it dates or how it started. But essentially, it's this. Sometime during the meal, the father of the family would take the afikomen, which is wrapped, and he would hide it away. The children of the family would then go and search for the afikomen. When someone finds it, they bring it back to the father, and he gives them a gift in return. Now, this is just fascinating and awesome symbolism. Just as Jesus was pierced, we see that unleavened bread is pierced. In fact, even before uh, the advent of machines to pierce today's modern matzah, ancient matzah used to be pierced with some kind of a nail. And we also see that because it went through the oven, it's also somewhat striped. It's wrapped, it's hidden away. These things happened to the Messiah when he came. And just as the young children of the family can receive a gift when they find the wrapped and hidden away afikomen, so anybody today, regardless of their ethnicity, their race, it doesn't matter. When they find Jesus as Messiah, when they believe in him as God's sole provision for sin, they receive a gift as well. They receive the gift of the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life after death. Ephesians 2 verse 8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. We also know from the New Testament that Jesus is described as the bread of life. John chapter 6, verses 48 through 51 says the following, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread, Jesus says, that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. Right, right there is the promise of eternal life whenever we believe upon the Lord Jesus. He says, the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And indeed, Jesus laid down his life for the sins of the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, For Messiah, our Passover, 
has been sacrificed. Let's turn over, if you would, to page 36. At the top, we see that personal faith is required. This has been the case since the beginning of creation. We read in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that Abram believed the Lord and God credited him as righteousness. We also mentioned earlier that the blood had to actually be applied to the doorposts for God to pass over the home and life to be granted. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 tells us that if you confess with your mouth, Yeshua is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. At the conclusion of the Last Supper, which again was a Passover meal, we see that Yeshua took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you would, turn over to page 38. We're ready for our third cup. So at this time, go ahead and take another cup and pour yourself some grape juice. You can see in your Haggadah that this third cup is actually called the cup of redemption or grace. And it's believed that this is the cup that we base communion on today. Why do we say that? Well, we read in Luke 22, verse 20, it says, In the same way, he, Jesus, also took the cup after supper, which traditionally is the third cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. And so the next time that you celebrate communion, I hope you'll remember the strong connection to Passover. Indeed, the communion cup was extracted right from the Passover meal. This particular cup is connected to, of course, another promise in Exodus. When God said, I will redeem you, hence the name, the cup of redemption. And it's a very appropriate cup to be the one at Jesus' final supper when he was about to provide redemption for the sins of the world. I'll say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English, and we'll drink together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagefen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth fruit from the vine. Amen. Now that we've completed our third cup, let's look over on page 39 at the very top. We see here a picture of the cup of Elijah. I have that right here on this side of the table. Typically, there is a place setting for Elijah the prophet. Why is that? Well, we read in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says, look, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet. You see, Elijah the prophet comes in advance or just prior to the Messiah's arrival. And so as to symbolize that, the Jewish people have an extra place for Elijah and even a cup for him, just in case he's coming to announce that the arrival of the Messiah has come. We see also a reference to this in the New Testament. It says, but I tell you, in Matthew 17, Elijah has already come, but they didn't recognize him. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. Again, this sense of expectancy of Elijah's appearance at the Seder table serves to remind us of the Lord's promised return. How eagerly do we await his return, his appearance again? Now, you'll see in the next few pages, beginning on page 40, that there's what's called Hillel. These are simply psalms. This is where we get the name or the word hallelujah from. And these are oftentimes traditionally sung before, during, and after the Passover meal. In fact, we read in the New Testament account that at the end of the Passover meal, 
it says they sang some hymns or some psalms, and then they went out. And I'd encourage you to read through these particular psalms, as it's very encouraging and uplifting. Well, this brings us to page 48, and we are at the conclusion of our Seder meal. There's a summary prayer at the top of 48 that I'd encourage you to read with me. Praise be your name forever, our King, who rules and is great, and holy in heaven and on earth. For to thee, Lord our God, it is fitting to render song and praise, hallel and psalms, power and dominion, victory, glory and might, praise and beauty, holiness and sovereignty, blessings and thanks, from now and forever. Well, this brings us to our fourth cup. And let's go ahead and pour our fourth cup now. Once you have your fourth cup, go ahead and just sit that on the table in front of you. And I am going to turn in our scriptures to Matthew chapter 26. This, of course, is the account of Jesus' final Passover meal. Matthew chapter 26. I'll begin reading in verse 26. It says this, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the third cup that we already drank. And it's interesting, after that third cup, Jesus says, in verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So, we have our fourth cup here. This cup is called the cup of thanksgiving or the cup of praise. And it connects to Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, and God's promise, I will take you as my people. I'll say the blessing in Hebrew and then in English, and we're going to pause. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bore pri hagefen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And just as Jesus said, he's not going to drink it again with us until we see him in the kingdom of heaven, we are going to leave our fourth cup filled on the table in hopeful expectation of that glorious day when we drink it with Jesus in the Messianic kingdom. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Life and Messiah Interactive Passover. I hope this has been a wonderful blessing for you and your family. If you have any questions for us, any comments, feel free to go to our website and give us an email. We'd love to hear from you on how this has impacted you and your family. God bless and have a wonderful, happy Passover.